Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus just to give you praise and honor and glory. Now as we get ready to start the word to come forth, God, we just ask now your blessing upon it. Uh, we just thank you for this, uh, the, the moment of, of your Holy Spirit and your, your presence here of standing on your word where two or three are gathered in your name. You are here in the midst. And so, Lord, now I just ask for your help with this. And the Holy Spirit, I ask you to go forth and you do an awesome work with this word. And in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Yeah. We have started a series called Shades of Grey. This is a relationship and, and marriage uh, series that is going to kind of just help us look at our relationships and uh, marriages in that um, it's to ask the questions, the hard questions, and to make marriages and relationships last longer than, than, than our, in our lives. And we kind of looked at last week, we kind of looked at 50% uh, uh, of even um, Christians and their marriages is coming to an end. It's like so. It's like one out of two marriages. Even if you say you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to get a divorce. You know. So it's like this. So to ask you this question, this is a really hard question. Okay, uh, it, it is. How many of you, by the raise of your hand, at the beginning of when you were getting married and you got into this relationship, your intent was sometime in your marriage you're going to commit adultery. You you purposely had it set in your mind. I'm going to get married, and sometime in my marriage I'm going to commit adultery. Any hands? Any hands? Any hands? Uh, well, that was too hard of a question. Okay, how about uh, let's maybe let's let's make it let's a little bit um, maybe a little bit something different. Okay, how many of you in your relationship you got in together, you know, and you're so infatuated with each other, you're going to get married, or even at the beginning of your marriage, you kind of just had it set out in your mind. Sometime in my marriage, I'm going to get hooked on pornography. Anybody? Anybody? How about anybody I'm watching online? Any, anybody? You just had your mind made up that you were going to do that. Still too intense. Something that you just really, okay? All right, well, let's try one maybe a little bit less, okay? All right. How many of you at the beginning of your relationship and at the beginning of your marriage, you had it in your mind, you were going to do sometime in the future of your marriage, you are going to have an emotional affair? Anybody? You know what that is? That means you're, you're involved with somebody of the opposite sex, okay? But there's no touching and feeling going on there. You just, your heart is tied to them because of the conversations and the things that you're, you're loving each other because of the conversations that are going on. Emotional tie. So you're having an emotional affair with them. Okay, anybody set out to do that? No, nobody? Nobody? No hands? How about, uh, online? Any, anybody? I didn't think so. It seems like we have this intent to get started in relationships, and then all of a sudden something happens in our lives and it goes away. It goes just wrong. And end up somebody somewhere does something wrong in the marriage, and that's why it comes to a divorce, or it comes to a separation, or it comes to a like every day doesn't go by without a single, without a fight that's going, you're throwing stuff, somebody's getting hurt, the police are being called, something bad is happening. Because of what we're doing is we're living in gray areas of our lives and the gray areas of our lives is sin before God. And what it is is nobody's calling out sin for what it is. And what we're doing is we're making up a God to suit ourselves so that we can be happy at what we're doing. So it's the idea of this, this statistic is really mind-blowing. The statistic says that 75% of people do at least one of those questions I just asked you earlier. Do at least one, if not all of them, of committing adultery, of end up being hooked on pornography, or getting emotionally attached and having an emotional affair with somebody. 75% of those people that have that happen. This, this, is, this is an absolute mind-blowing that so many people fall into this. It, it, it's the idea of saying, that maybe to ask you this question. This is a really hard question. Okay? To be honest. 
Okay? How many of you think that adultery is wrong? How many of you think adultery is wrong? Okay. But in that, you're thinking and you're saying it's wrong and you're agreeing with that, that there's still your involvement of one way or another in your life. And maybe it might have been in the past. Maybe you weren't living right for Jesus. It's still the idea that you're saying it's wrong and we have been found in that guilty of one of the three. We've been flirting or we've been looking at pictures because, you know, we're looking at naked people because my spouse isn't given to me and meeting my needs, you know, and so in that I'm going to find it somewhere else by just even, I'm not touching her, I'm not looking, but I'm just looking. I'm not touching him, I'm just looking. That's what pornography is. It's, it's a lust, it's a desire. And so what we're going to really touch on today is Purity. That, 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 that living a life that is pure. And we're going to find out God's thoughts on that. And where He stands on how we should live. And to get out of this gray area of where we're at. And to live either black or white. We're either with God or we're not. And in that, our relationships will change. <laughs> Whether it be from this point on, you might be in a relationship, it's over, it's done with. But your next relationship will work out because you're going to take the things that God's teaching you and you're going to follow them and you're going to live by His principle and say, that's sin, I'm not doing it. It destroyed my last marriage, it destroyed my last relationship, I'm not doing it. And then you live a pure life from that point on. And why this is being taught is that we need a foundation of even older people to pass it down to the next generation that this is calling it out sin. What we're doing is we're not talking about it. We're just thinking it's something that we don't need to discuss. And the next generation is falling into a deep sin of bad habits and thinking that everything's going to be all right. But if you continually do something, the same thing, same thing, same thing, and the results are always the same, then that means what you're doing is wrong and it ain't working. So sin is wrong and quit sinning and we need and you'll find out the consequences will go away. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at this scripture and build from here on what God thinks about purity. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 we're going to read Hebrews 13 verse 4. Marriage should be honored by all. Man, honored is a big word. It, it mean, that means by all. That means it is something special. Marriage is something special. And the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all sexual immoral. So what do you think God's saying here? I think He's saying that sex, He made sex, is good. It's awesome. In the bed of marriage. When you're married. Outside of marriage, you're going to have problems. You're going to wonder why you're having this emotional, oh, you don't love me anymore. You know, because what the problem is, is we got a bunch of people that are living out here that are not married and they're doing everything and expecting all the benefits of God that He gave for marriage. And they're wondering why they're not coming. Because you're not following God's principles. Of marriage. So, he's saying here is that sex is for the marriage bed and you're to keep it pure, you're to stay there. And God is saying here, he's saying that, that, that last part there, God will judge the adulterer and all the sexual immoral. Oh, what's that mean? That means that this man is having an affair with this woman they're both married and they're having sex outside of the marriage and they're leaving their partners out of it okay that's where God's going to judge them the, the sexual immorals is the woman with the woman and the man with the man that's immoral they're going to be judged God is saying he will judge it I ain't judging them I ain't, this is God's word what he's going to do it's a sin the sex outside of marriage is the same as this man over here. He leaves his wife and goes and be with this man. It's the same. It's a sin. It's disgusting and God's going to judge it. 
So in that, that's where we're going to start this, this, this today's word is going to start off with that God has a point of saying marriage is to be pure. And we're to live this way. And this word is not being passed around enough to be able to say, you know what, I think you're living together. It ain't going to work. It just ain't going to work. Why you say that? We love each other so much. Well, according to what God says, God's not in the middle of your relationship. And so when you've got unequally yoked people trying to pull two different directions, you're trying to pull towards God, He's trying to pull towards His self-desires, you're going to pull apart. You're not going to stay together. That's just what His Word is. And then the judgment will come of... Uh, it's all natural. The judgment is there. Because you're going to pull apart. That's the judgment. Let alone some other things that God might get involved with. And he says, well, okay, according to me, I, 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 you know better. And for that, because his word says judgment starts with the house of God and his people. So if you know you know better, and you're still doing wrong unto him, he's going to bring judgment to you, and you're going to get a spanking. Can I get any plainer than that? The University of California did a study. They found that just in one decade, from 1998 to 2008, just 10 years, the committing of adultery had doubled. From 1998 to 2008. The committing of adultery, this is the physical act of their married people having sex with somebody, not their married person, not with a married person, had doubled. So in that, what is our mindset of our community, of, of our people, that, and our generation that we live in? We think that having sex is a good thing, and it's okay to whoever we have it with. But according to God, he's saying, no, that's wrong. That we need to keep ourselves pure for only the one we are married to. I don't care. Listen, I don't care if you're 16 or you're 56 or you're 76 or you're 96. Sex is for marriage and you're to stay pure until you get married. And in that, your marriage and your sex is between you and your married partner. That, that's it. Husband and wife. Let me make that married partner clear. I stand on that. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Because Adam and Eve can multiply. Adam and Steve can't multiply. God had a purpose of why He made what He made. Amen. Let's get that clear. Amen. So in that, why is impurity in marriage increasing? Why is this adulterous affair or, or spirit among our people in America, why is it increasing? I think there's more temptation today than ever in the past. There's more temptation before the people. Before, you know, when we were kids, you know, the only way you were ever going to see as a, as a young, young, maybe starting into teenager or teenager, to see any kind of naked women on uh, pornography or anything is that your friend's, his daddy had to have a, a, a Playboy or something stashed somewhere, and, you, and the kid found it, and he would drag it out and hide it and get it all his buddies over there in the cornfield, is where we, where we were at, in the cornfield, in a little Pot in our little little area that we knocked all the corn out and we had a little place there where we had a little fire going on there and we would sit there and, 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 and what was his name? Billy. Billy would hand out the magazine and we would all be passing it around looking at the naked women. <laughs> now as a kid, teenager, all you got to do is pull up on your phone and hook up to the internet whether you got phone service or get a Wi-Fi and all you got to do is make a few punch notes in it and next thing you know you're looking at for a boy you're naked, naked women for a, a girl you're looking at naked men. It's within an instant you could be looking at pornography and then what is it it's doing? It's burning something in your head of a sin and thinking it's okay and then you're getting into a, 
a, a relationship with somebody and they're not meeting this fantasy that you had, that, this picture that you had, that you saw. And next thing you know, you're wondering why she don't love you or he don't love you is because you've already in my, in, in, in dwelled in your mind such sinful things that it's not working. The temptation is there. And it's bad. I think the next thing that would be causing a, an increase of adulterous affairs and, and problems in our marriages is people are getting married later. Oh, but, but pastor, that's a good thing. People are getting married later. They're kind of holding off. No, 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 no. They're getting married later, so that means they're having more sex partners and they're taking more sex partners into their next marriage. And in that, their mind is messed up because they're comparing now who they're married to to the last four or five people that they had sex with before them. Hold on, are we, are we, are we there? Are we, are we talking any truth? Does anybody be, kind of sticking the, uh, I'm, I'm making this is really hitting home. See, that's why it's so wrong in dating. It should be more of a courtship of before you get married is that because what you're doing is dating really sets you up to fail. It sets you up for divorce. I don't like this person anymore. I'm breaking up with them. You get into a marriage five years down the road. I don't like them anymore. I'm getting divorced. I'm leaving. I'm out. So what is it? The, 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 the getting married later in life is really not a good thing sometimes. Because from the age of 14 until the age of 32, how many sex partners have they had? And now they're expecting, expecting this marriage to come off with a hitch and be the most happiest in relationship they ever had. And then five years down the road, they're in divorce court. Taking each other for everything they got. That's my dog. No, that's my dog. No, that's my couch. That's No, that's my chair. No, you know, no it, it's the idea that, that we are in, in, in a culture that we're thinking that sex is okay. It is okay for married couples. Because if you do any study on it, the long end, the long end of it all is, is that it doesn't bring no good when you're having sex out of what God ordained and, and, it's, and, it, and it always ends up bad. I think one of the other things is, uh, I, I kind of wrote this note here. Is you don't build a life on purity on a foundation of sin and lies. When you're bringing in baggages and you're not telling the whole truth from the get-go to your partner, you're married, coupled, then they're wondering what's wrong. And here what they're doing is they're just, they have this other baggage from the other relationships and they're bringing it in and it's not being straight up. I think one of the other reasons is that a growing, in, a growing sense of entitlement. We live in a culture now that we think we're entitled. It's really big in the teenage, young, younger, younger, younger generation. Bad. But you know what? I see it in some adults too. Bad. I'm entitled. I, I, I deserve this. What did you do? You just you, so you worked all your life. Who, who cares? You think you deserve that? We all deserve one thing. Death and to live the rest of our life in hell. Because that's what sin is against God. But see, God's love for us and His favor towards us is gives us a chance to say, I want to know God more and so what I want to do is I want to ask for forgiveness of my sin and ask Jesus to cleanse me and come in and for the Holy Spirit to baptize me so I can have a relationship with Him and in that I don't deserve death now I deserve life because what God did on the cross through Jesus Christ His death and His burial and resurrection the only entitlement there is I don't get to go to hell now. I get to go to heaven. But from that point on, you're entitled to nothing. 
entitled to nothing but we live life as that I, I, I am entitled to that woman right there because she's so stinking gorgeous me and her are going to hook up we're going to have we're going to go and do it tonight and we're going to I deserve that I had a hard day at work today I'm going to go get me some beers and I'm going to go get, get, get high you know, me and her are going to go do the wild thing because I deserve it Oh, the nasty. How about that one? We could do the nasty. It is nasty if you're not doing it in marriage. But when you're in marriage, it's not the nasty. You do the happy dance. Purity. Purity honors God. So let's kind of look at what God, some more of what God thinks about this. <coughs> and 1 Corinthians 6, chapter 12 through 20 reads this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me take a drink before we go reading this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 through 20. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, all things are lawful, but all things are not helpful. There's some things in life that are, that, that, you know, it's, it's alright to do, but is it going to help you? Is it going to help you? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for, for the stomach and the stomach for the food, but God will, will destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Ooh, what? Let me read that part again. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Hmm. Verse 14. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise up by His power. Verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take a member of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who joins to the Lord is one spirit with him. Verse 18. <laughs> Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside of the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Do you want to know why some of us have failed marriages? We went into the marriage, we went into a relationship with this. God's not involved. Because... They're good looking. They treat me right. They're going to take care of me. I'm going to help them. We're going to be a good. We're going to be a good match. God's not involved. We have sex before the marriage in the relationship. We move forward into it. Then we're wondering why it's falling apart. Because the original plan, what God is saying here, is that. When you ask Jesus to come into your heart and take away your sins, you were bought with a price. And in that, now with that price of the blood of Jesus Christ who died on the cross, who had the nails in His hands and His feet and the thorn on His head and the spear in His side, who died for your sins, 
You belong to Him because He paid your debt, your sin debt, so that you can spend eternity in heaven. You belong to Him. And now you're doing things against Him. And now you're wondering why things are bad? It's the consequences of sin. And the only way out of it is to repent and turn back to God and whatever, whenever it gets left behind because it was sin, praise the Lord because He will give you new. He will take care of you. He will bless you. He will bring you another way. But it's the idea of saying, what was sin was conceived in sin, leave it. Let it go. The biggest reason we should remain sexually pure is because what we do with our bodies either honors God or dishonors God. And everything we've done in life, I think we've done a lot of things in our lives that we thought we were doing it because it made me happy. And God was not even in the picture. It was about me, I, self, I want to be happy. Self-entitlement. And in that, we have dishonored God. And we wonder why America's falling apart. We wonder why ISIS is coming in and making threats. And they're, gonna, they're in full tent is to do that. And if the President of the United States keeps going down the path, they are going to bring destruction to America because he's doing squat about it. Why? Because America has left out God in everything, starting with marriage and relationships in, 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 our, in our lives. And we're passing that down, that generational sin, down to the next generation to our children and then to our grandchildren. We're passing that down that it's okay. It's okay to have sex outside of marriage. It's okay to live together and, and, and play the marriage role. And not be married. Expect all the benefits of marriage that God has proclaimed. And not be married. So what does it look like? Because when I was, when, when I was reading this, here's what really kind of caught my eye there. Is that we're not just also sinning against God. Did you catch that? We're sinning against ourselves too. Uh, we're, so automatically, we're getting a double whammy. I don't know about you, but I don't like doing stuff bad to myself. I like myself too much to do that. Especially when I look in the mirror and I just got out of the shower and I'm putting that nice little stuff in my hair. I remember when I had long hair, man. It, used to take me, it took me longer to do my hair than my sister. I don't like my hair. I had some nice hair. But in his word, what he's saying is, we're doing stuff in this sin. It's not just sinning against God, we're sinning against ourselves. We're hurting ourselves. So, what does it look like to have inward and outward purity for God? First, our, our outward purity is our behavior. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, it says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity. Ouch. There's not to be an inward hint. How, how, do, we, how do we stop that? How do we, how do we prevent that? Proverbs, of course, said, I don't have that up here. Proverbs 5, 8 says this. It says, keep to a path far from her. Do not go near her door or her house. Why? Because she's the one leading you astray. Because her intent to you as a man is to get something from you and she has the tools to make you give it up. They know that. And for the women, it will be the same for you. You need to stay far away from his house. You need to stay away from his phone. You know why? 
Because he says those nice things about how you look in that. And that you absolutely turn him on. And you like that. And what is it going to do? It's causing you to sin. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 6, 18, 19 and 20 says, Flee from sexual immorality. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Hourly, this is what it looks like. You need to do everything you can to run from the sexual sin that is going to bring you down. For some, they need to hook up with somebody, and not their spouse, but somebody that will absolutely get in their face and say, uh, I got an email from your, um, your internet protection thing, that your phone, that you was looking at something that you weren't supposed to be looking at. There are safeguards out there for internet for people that have addiction to pornography problems. There are safeguards out there. And then and, and there's, there's phones. You can lock stuff out. If YouTube keeps drawing you over there to look at things that you're not supposed to, if the, if the uh, if Safari takes you to places that you know you're not supposed to, you can get up with somebody and they, they can, you can implement this stuff and you can lock yourself out and give them the, and they have the password. You don't have the password, they have the password. And lock yourself out of it for all your phone is good for is texting and phone call. And, and, and for some people, it, it'd be, you know, that's all you need because you got a problem. It's the same as a drinking or, 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 or a drug problem. You need to take drastic measures. And I think that's what our problem is. We've played so long in the, in the gray area of life that we're not taking it serious of the destruction that it's bringing to the next generation of, of living in sin against the holy God. We're just not serious about it. It's just a, it's okay. And we've made a God to suit our okay living in our sin that we're living in. How about inwardly? What, what is inward purity of the heart? What does that look like? In Psalms 119, 9-11, it says, How can a young man keep his way pure? Good question. By living according to your word, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden, my, hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You, know, you. you want to know how to stay pure in your heart? That means you need to know his word. If you don't ever pick up the Bible and you only go to church on Sunday and you only listen to the preacher that just that half hour or 45 minutes that he's preaching there, you don't know God. And there's no fear of God in you. You know what will keep you straight? The fear of God. The fear of God that says if you be a bad girl or boy, you're going to get a spanking by a holy God. And I don't know about you, I don't like spankings from God Jehovah. I don't like them. Because they hurt. We have no fear of God because we don't know His Word. We don't read it. So how can you know to do right if you don't know it? The children in your house or the grandchildren in your house, they come in through the house. They come up there and they punch the little girl. And you're going to drag that kid in the other room and beat the crap out of him on their butt with a paddle? Were they ever told the rule of your house that they're not allowed to hit in your house? No, they weren't. So in their, what was probably acceptable at their home, that's not acceptable in your home, they don't know that rule. So what needs to be done is they need to know the rule. So how are you going to know the rule? You need to speak it to them. So God is saying, the rules I have are written down right here. You want to know them? Read them. 
Because everything you're not going to get it all in, in 45 minutes from a preacher. That could be he could be preaching on something else and, and God's wanting to talk to you about something totally different. So that you don't have to pay the consequences of sin. We continually fall down. As, Why is this always happening to me? Well, did you? This is the same thing we talked to you two years ago. You come into us again, and you're repeating the same thing, and you're expecting different results. Really? Let's try it again. I said this two years ago. If you don't do this and you don't get up and start following God and do His ways and follow Him, you're going to have this happen to you. Divorce, jail time, lose your home, lose, your, lose all your stuff, fighting all the time. You're going to do all that. If you'll just leave all that behind and follow God and let Him take care of you, then you will understand that what all that sin and stuff, it will go away and we won't be back here again in two years. Or six months. We continually do stuff and, and, and do it the same way and expect different results. Wake up. It ain't going to happen. Until you follow God in His ways, you're going to have the same results, maybe even worse. That's the, that's the real truth. For the wages of sin is death. And I don't know about you, sometimes it might get worse. Some idiot says, you know what, I'm sick and tired of your behavior, I'm just going to shoot you. That's, the, that's our culture anymore. It's bad. And God is saying, listen, it's the heart. It's the heart. You need a heart transplant. You need a new heart. And now, you know what it is? You need to leave all of that junk behind and follow me. Yeah, you got people that hate you. Yeah. You got people that want to hurt you. Yeah. But the Bible says to follow him, one of his commands is, love your enemy. Oh, Love your enemy as you love yourself. Ah. I don't want to hear that. I want to see I want to see a, I want to see him going to the funeral home in a bag. That's what I want to see. That's not God's word. God's word is love your enemy. Because if you don't and you hate them, what you're doing is you're committing a sin in your heart. Just like adultery, you're looking at that woman and you're lusting after her, that's adultery in your heart. Just as you look at that person over there and you're wanting to kill them, you're committing a murder and that's a sin against God. Are we there? The whole point of all of this is that we've got this gray area in life. We're doing stuff. And in this doing stuff, we're sinning against God, but we're thinking it's okay. It's not okay. It's not. It's a sin against God and we need to stop it. Inward heart. We need an inward heart transplant. And how does that work? God, I need to ask you to forgive me of my sins. I have a problem with this. Help me get over it. I can't do it on my own because I just would rather, I would just, I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't get off the internet. I can't quit looking at that woman or that man. I can't keep talking to them. I can't keep hating them. I, keep, I got all these problems. I need help with my mind and my heart. You got to help me change it. Help me get there. And you got to pray that and you got to mean it and watch God show up and show off. He will get you that help. He will get you that help. And, and uh, Matthew chapter 5 verse 28 says, it's not up here, it, it, it says Matthew 28 verse tw uh, 5 verse 28 says, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, it's the intent of the heart. Our holy God and how 
pure he is is being so profound in saying it's not just your actions of you touching her or making out with her or him or touching him it's the idea that you're looking and you're desiring and in that God's saying I want you to be pure and in that if it's, it's, it's this way you look up you look away Reminds me of this story. This preacher was telling this story. He was funny. He was hilarious. He was invited with a friend and, and, and a couple of his buddies from the church, you know, to go out on his boat. You know, they weren't going to go fishing. They were just going to go riding on the boat. And as they're riding on the boat, you know, and they're just going, you know, they're just having a good old time. And all of a sudden they hear this, Hey! And all six, six men turn to look. And this woman goes like this and brings her top down and goes, Woo! All six men went like this. <laughs> All six men went like this. Whoop! And looked away. <laughs> Imagine what she was going through because of the culture of life was just like, if they looked away, then there's something wrong with me. I, I mean, I need to go back to the doctor or maybe up, low, up, up, uh, upgrade, up, <laughs> upload, <laughs> upgrade or whatever. You know, her self-esteem is that. But no, you know what? Them guys were doing right. Yeah. Because they were doing right by themselves. They were doing right by their wives. And they were doing right by their church and their God because their pastor had already preached on that and how they should behave. And they listened to the man of God and they did and they turned away because you know what? Here's where you catch yourself lusting. You turn away and then you went, I got to get a second look because those look pretty real. <laughs> and then now you're lusting. <laughs> for a woman it's the same thing when the guy's over there he's ripping his shirt off and the six pack abs and you know and your husband he's got a six pack in his hand you know uh, 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 you know it's the idea of just saying you know we have lived in a culture and God is calling us up he's saying it's time to rise up my people it's time to rise up we need to set an example but here's one thing that I want to get before we close. I want to kind of just kind of, how do you know? How do you know about if somebody's really living an impure life? How, how do you, maybe you're living an impure life and I'm going to confront you with it. Or somebody's going to, to really confront you. You know, one of the ways is that when you confront somebody about their impurity, about their living in sin, they're defensive. They are defensive. They've always got an excuse. There's always something there that they gotta they make them a reason for why they're living with this person and they're having sex. Or why they're living with this person in the appearance. Because again, God's word is so clear. Check this out. His word is so clear. It says this. It says that if you are doing something in the appearance of sin, it is sin because you're causing somebody else to sin. Does that make sense? When you make somebody else sin because of what you're doing, you're sinning. So if you're having a relationship with somebody and to your friend at work sees that relationship, to them they're thinking they're married and they're, they're living together or whatever like that and they're having sex. To them, she's thinking that's it's okay. Now you've committed, because she's thinking it's okay, you have committed sin because she's, she's going to sin because she thinks it's okay. Same with your children, your grandchildren. That's His Word. That's not my Word. I'm just following and saying what He has said already for over 2,000 years, over 2,000 years in the New Testament of His writings. His love for us is so great. One of the other things that you can tell when somebody's <clears throat> impure, they're living an impure life, they have no remorse. They're absolutely not, they have no remorse about what they're doing. They will go somewhere and their wife will be sitting there right beside them or their girlfriend that they're dating will be sitting right there and this gorgeous girl will walk by and their jaw will drop and they'll gawk like crazy and all of a sudden they get caught by somebody and be confronted about it and there's no remorse about it. None. None. 
If you're in a relationship, you're not married to that person yet, run. Because they either right now have a problem and you don't know about it, or you're going to get treated like crap later after he acquires you as his property of marriage. Because that's probably right now why he's with you. Is that his goal is to, I got, she is on my shelf. I, I got her, nailed her, married her, that's mine. Guys think that way. And last, repentance. There is no repentance. You now, repentance means it's not just saying I'm sorry, because that's what they do all the time when they get caught or when they do something. I'm sorry, babe. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I won't do it again, babe. And next uh, Friday, they're doing the same thing they just got caught for. Repentance means that they're going to turn away, change their thinking of what they're doing, and not act that way and do something different and not go back to that. That's repentance, true repentance. And in that, they're still on their phone, looking at the pornography and the girls. They're still flirting with the, the people. They're still gawking. They're still doing all this stuff. And there's no true repentance. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says this, <clears throat> Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings Death. God wants us to live a pure life. It's His desire for us. And I know it's hard in this world. With the access and the things that are all, all around us, just go to the food line and walk in the line and there's the magazine rack right there as you're walking there and the girl's standing there in her little bikini like nothing thread on her. You know, you look at it was like, oh my gosh, my little boy's standing there and i got to stand like this so he don't see that stuff. That's all right. That's, I like going to the grocery store by myself anyway. <laughs> it's, 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 I don't pay attention because I don't look at them. But, the, but, the, but the men, right? The men go through the lines that go through the lines and then even how many children are, are, are being submitted to that. Let alone the culture of the movies and things that are coming on, and or maybe even just watching regular TV with the commercials. The commercials are horrible. How would you be compromising your purity and putting yourself at risk? Maybe there's somebody watching. How are you compromising your purity and putting yourself at risk? Maybe you need to change your schedule of you're doing something so you won't run into somebody that you keep kind of looking at. Maybe you need to, maybe you just need to get somebody to sit down with and say, hey, listen, I need to put this on my computer, I need to put this on my phone, and I need you to have the passwords, and, I need, and it's going to email you stuff if I do something wrong. And delete Facebook. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's a, uh, Maybe it's something that you need to take drastic measures in. What outward or inward changes do you need to make to ensure that you live a life of purity how God meant it? I'll leave with that closing question. What changes do you need to make inwardly and outwardly? To ensure a life of purity that will honor God. To bow your heads. As we close in prayer, the first thing I think to, to know to, to, that is to live a pure life, to, to, to honor God, is salvation. Do you truly have salvation? Do you trust Jesus with your salvation? Did you really ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Maybe that's some of the struggles that you're going with is that you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
to get out of some of the issues that you're in, you need Jesus to help you. And in that, you need to ask for forgiveness of your sins. And now is the time to do it. For the rest of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, maybe we need a heart check. Maybe we're doing something and we need Jesus to come in and say, hey, I, I got, I, I'm going to admit it. I got this problem. I got this problem. And admit to God and to Jesus, you got a problem. And ask for His help and forgiveness. Now is the time of repentance. Of changing the way you're thinking. Because what you're thinking is wrong. If it's bringing sin to God and to you and to somebody else. Sin is wrong. And God is calling you out. Holy Spirit, is He's got it on your brain. It's sticking in your brain right now. And you remember it. And the Holy Spirit is telling you what you're thinking is wrong. You need to stop it. And if you need help with it, ask Him. And He will help get rid of that thought. As we pray, will you do that? Will you repent? Will you seek God? Will you, will you make your life pure for Him? Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus to thank you for this day. God, Holy Spirit, thank you for this word. We stand on the word of, uh, of Isaiah that your word will go forth and it will accomplish the things whereunto it is sent. Forgive us of our sins, O God, that we may bring honor and glory to you. Forgive us of our impurities, Lord. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And for those that don't know you as Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit, lead them in the, repair, the, the prayer of repentance. Forgive us of our sins. And I believe Jesus Christ is who He is, that He died and was raised from the dead to forgive me of my sins, to die for my sins, that I may be born again, that you may baptize me in the Holy Spirit, and that I may be part of your family, and that I may follow you all the days of my life and make you Lord of my life. Because as we read in the Scripture earlier, that we don't belong to us anymore, we belong to You. And in that, Lord, help us, help us follow You. God, I bless these people in the name of Jesus with Your Holy Spirit, that they will bring conviction and direction to pure a pure life that will bring honor to You and them. <coughs> And God, in this next week, I ask You that You will show up and show off Your love for these people. That they will see Your grace and Your mercy in their lives. Open their eyes to see Your love like they've never seen it before. In Jesus' name, Amen.